Good morning. Uh, it's, a, whew, it's a bit of an echo. Uh, good morning. It's a fantastic room out here. It's such a big audience. I, I think I can see all the way into Copenhagen over there. Um, hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about democratizing cities, but um, give you a little bit of background. I'm co-founded Zero Zero, and so I'm really talking on behalf of a, a large group of people um, who are there, and there's many others, and Imi Core is already in the audience, but there's many, many other people involved. Um, I suppose the kind of topic of democratizing the city is, is an unusual topic, because in a way, I think what we're talking about is a different type of democratizing. Too often the notion of democracy in many of our conversations has been reduced to this. A very particular this, as you'll notice, which is the vote. Whereas democracy is much more than just the vote. Democracy, democracy is an architecture which sits on the democratization of knowledge, capital, agency, and many, many other things. Yet we often end up reducing everything to this, the vote. Now, if you look back at the mature, maturing nature of democracies, actually even in the UK, United Kingdom, what we saw was way before the emancipation and the vote being given to many, many of the population, we had schools for the poor, libraries, banks for the poor. These all happened before actually the vote was released. So when we talk about democracy, let's talk about the full stack of democracy, not just the vote. And for some of you, and some of you tech geeks, you'll all know that there's a lot of really interesting conversations where people talk about liquid democracy. And actually what they're really often talking about is liquid voting. So how do we talk about liquid democracy in a full stack sense? And I want to talk about this in a way of how I think cities are being reinvented and actually how we're starting to change the nature of how we make and do in the 21st century. And the democracy I'm interested in is the power to create society. How do we democratize the power to create society? Not consume, but to actually the power to create society. I'm not interested in this type of architecture either. This is an architecture that's one RBA building of the year about two years ago. It's a private house, beautiful private house, but it's actually a, a private house for an individual. How is that affecting the nature of the cities and actually the nature of many, many people's lives? Most of architecture is produced by very, very four, four very, very few groups of population, certainly in, in the, uh, globally. How do we start to talk about this in the long tail sense? How do we start to talk, not about the just the big few, but the many? So what do cities look like when you start to talk about cities for the 99%? Now, unlike the previous speakers, I'm, I'm not perhaps one of the most great analysts of the world that actually we had speaking, but most of my journey has been based on building stuff and making things. And on that basis, I'm going to sh try to illustrate some of the learnings that we're having in the process of making new types of institutions, actually new types of places, and new types of environments for, 20, for 99%. First one I want to talk about is one of three kind of attitudes to democratizing city. One is open making. In this, we did something called the Wiki House. We were invited by... Uh, uh, <laughs> exhibition and a sort of conference in South Korea to sort of say, how could you do something wiki? And we said, right, we'll do something around the house. How would you open source the house? How would you actually design a house which could be iterated and involved by people? And we started to actually design a kind of housing system, which is all open source. It's open design, built on digital fabrication. It can be pretty much cut anywhere in the world, automation and, and actual real-time real data. It can be played around with on SketchUp, pretty much live as you see it.
and it can be built. Built by, this, this was actually put together by four people over two weekends. Cut on sheets of plywood digitally. And it can be manipulated really, really easily. Then you could do really crazy things like open source windows, which are very, very high performance windows, which we actually designed and open sourced, all the way through to smart controls. And these are being built around the world. Now, the really remarkable thing was when we did this, was actually there's about 32 chapters around the world that took our stuff and made it way better. So the guys in New Zealand turned around and said, hey, we'll take your stuff and we're going to make it earthquake proof. They made the first wiki house, which is earthquake proof, after the, after the earthquake in Churchfield. And it kept going. But this is kind of like not new, right? This is like barn raising, but open source barn raising. So suddenly you're not just doing it for one group of people, but actually you're doing it all around the world. And these people, we're iterating our knowledge. So yesterday, one of the really interesting things was around Minecraft was actually the kind of social learning infrastructure around, our, around design. How groups, 32 communities, probably the largest R&D community in architecture, formally, around a single issue in the world, I would reckon. Iterating and evolving the design openly and in conversation. In this sort of future, what is the role of the architect? What is the role of design? When actually design becomes an iterative dialogue. In a way, the architecture is the architecture of the conversation, not the architecture of the product. You're no longer controlling products, you're actually facilitating conversations and iterative conversations, and you're seeding conversations with a particular narrative. That was just the beginning of the journey. Then we decided to take the same approach and apply it to furniture. Open source furniture. That's printed pretty much anywhere around the world. In four weeks, we had something like 8,000 downloads literally everywhere in the world. People were downloading the designs and printing it using CNC routers locally. Literally everywhere. I mean, all the way, Ghana, you can name it. There was not a part of the world that wasn't covered. And then people were taking pictures, iterating the designs, and sharing them back. Now, what did that do? Local production, so now, Open desks pretty much deliver, can deliver pretty much anywhere within seven days of your order, maximum. And it's usually delivered within seven miles. It's printed and uh, made within seven miles of your location. And there's a global design community iterating it. And it's not shabby chic, <laughs> can do some nice stuff. But simultaneously, this is an amazing community in, in Bristol, led by Melissa Mean. She turned around and went to a local authority and said, who wanted to buy a bunch of furniture. She said, don't buy the furniture. Give us the 200,000. We will set up a factory, and we will print you all the furniture for the same price, and we'll train people up, and we'll have an ongoing factory, which is exactly what she delivered. And that's the community that was building out the furniture. So suddenly you're turning what is a capital asset into actually operation. Again, what is the nature of design and what is the nature of democracy in this process? How it, how it evolves? How do we take a Minecraft type approach to design and evolution of our cities, not just in Minecraft per se? And again, I want to il illustrate this. This is not just random stuff. This is quite well designed. People have really thought about what they want to do and they're iterating it. Second, 
actually, so we can talk about the physical making of things. What about the social process, the civic making? Too often when, you, when, when an architect would stand up in front of you and we'd talk about civic architecture, they'd start to talk about glass buildings. It's all transparent because it's glass. Or, even more amusing, they'll say, it's iterative design. And the iterative design component was actually just the building had been iterated on a computer four times till it had been ossified into a particular product. So what is civic? What is civic architecture? Well, actually, civic architecture is more than just actually the physical design. So this is a beautiful equation, and I love this equation because it says something about the nature of the environments we live in. So this is design cost. The cost it typically takes to design, about 10% of actually the physical cost of making something is typically design cost. And I mean architecture, uh, engineering, all of that, typically around 10%. One is capital cost. 1.5 is the cost over 20 years of maintaining that building. You see eight there. That's the cost of actually people in that space, your employee cost. Do you see the factor? One to 80 is the value of design to actually its impact on people. Now, the final one. How you procure, how you buy your food, how you actually maintain that building, that's your local economic multiplier. How does that building contribute to the local economy? How does that environment contribute to the local economy? So when we want to talk about civic architecture, we want to talk about the whole process of buildings. Too often, architects stand in front of you and show you buildings. What you want to be seeing is this. How does it contribute to the system? How does it contribute to the environment in a whole sense? It's not nice, sexy pictures, I grant you, but it's important. Because if you want to talk about democracy, you have to talk about the flows of value as well. And how does value move? Here's an example. It's a building we did, we did design. But what's really interesting about it is not the architecture, I'd say. What's really inter interesting about it is the business model, which is this is a building for charities and not-for-profits doing really amazing work around the world. Major foundations in the UK came together and said, look, we're funding these charities, and the money is going to developers and private landlords. We're going to fund our own building, and we'll recirculate the money. So the clever thing was actually the flow of value behind the building. It's called the Civic Foundry, won lots of awards, but probably won awards for the wrong thing. That was the genius of it. So look at the flows that happen behind things. We're often too seduced, and largely we're seduced because the images are easy. Whereas the flow of value is difficult to communicate. And until we start to communicate it, visually, graphically, we don't acknowledge it. Here's another one. It's a beautiful story of two women in Todd Morden who basically decided to plant every green space, every space available, round about anything, with cabbages, carrots, onions, potatoes, every green space available, literally every green space. Seven years later, depression rates are down, crime is down, unemployment is lower, now, which one of you would have said planting cabbages was going to get unemployment lower? <laughs> which startup guru would have said, let's have a startup fund, please? But what's interesting about this is that they were investing in social capital. Many, many people came out and started doing that stuff. Many, many people started harvesting that stuff. And they built weak ties. 
and those weak ties have massive effects in society. Now, the really remarkable thing is we can now measure this. Now, the second most remarkable thing is actually with instruments like social impact bonds, we can even fund oblique interventions. So what we're seeing in the civics is we're starting to find ways to not only measure, but also finance these sort of oblique interventions. What we're also seeing is classic ideas. This was a consultation exercise done on a library that was being closed. And you can imagine it. The local authority was trying to close a library, and the community was sitting there going, well, this is crap. They weren't believing them. They weren't believing anything they were saying and turned into a confrontation. The typical models of behavior of consulting don't work in this future. What you end up having to do is prototyping. We ended up prototyping new libraries with people. New models ended up with a crash in the middle of it. Ended up with 100 different services that the library service wasn't even thinking about because you were live, engaging, and iterating. So what does that do to the nature of how we produce, how we change, how we evolve? The agility becomes super important in the nature of design. And you guys are brilliant at this. This was 2007. We did the Bristol Urban Beach. We had 85,000 people turn up in four, in four weeks. Just packed out the whole space. I had the policemen tell me that there'd be crime, violence, everything. And if anything happened, they'd sue me personally. <laughs> and actually, what, what I realized was how you programmed the music of that space meant that kids were there. And actually, as long as you engage whole families in the process, you didn't get the violence. It's when you narrow-targeted small audiences, you tended to start to build that ecology. So when you start to think about this stuff, how do we civically make our spaces and buildings become super important? We put some of this together in the Compendium for the Civic Economy. You can download it for free, so it's not a plug or anything like that. Um, the second part of the story really starts to say, if this is part of the transition we're seeing in democratizing cities and the nature of how open systems and how we're starting to build environments, well, what does it start to do to some of our thinking, activity, even some of our kind of indoctrination that we've seen? So here's one of the challenges I want to put down. Maybe startups aren't the future. Maybe the notion of actually startups being the means of change is an illusion. Startups are very useful, powerful, but not the actual means of change. This is a journey that I've learned uh, after building impact hubs over the last nearly being involved in building impact hubs for nearly 10 years. And I used to think that actually social enterprises were the means of change, and we were part of that story. And I came across a really interesting story that made me reflect. This is a car crash in India. India has more deaths on the road than pretty much anywhere in the world per mile. A friend of mine, his close friend, passed away on the road. 45 minutes, nobody helped this person who was lying in their car. My friend left his job in the US, decided to move to India to do something about this. He thought, right, there's got to be a solution. There's an app required. I can build some technology. We can solve this. What's actually going on? He went there, said, is this an empathy problem? Well, no, not, not really. People did care. They were just afraid of the police. They were afraid that if they went to actually help people, they'd be taken in by the police as possible uh, culprits of the accident. On that basis, he turned around and said, right. He lobbied government, set up a whole judicial review system, massive public campaign, even got something passed in the law courts. At the end of it, 
he realised, well, who were, who was helping men and women who were caught in accidents? Well, it was police men and women. He then set up a reward scheme, recognising police men and women saving lives. Once he'd done that, he said, what next? Well, when they get to hospital, what happens? Actually, the doctors are incentivized per the cash they get out of a patient. So if the patient's unknown or unwell and they can't register something, they were sitting at the back of the queue. Then he lobbied government again and said, we've got to do something about this. And now, in India, every new road, most of them are toll roads, that's being built has automatic health insurance. After that, ambulances turned up. Doctors started to actually treat people. At the end of that, he built the app. The reason why I love this story, and I think it's really a salient lesson, is you start to realize that the complex challenges we're dealing with don't have single point interventions. There is no single app which solves this. There is no single technology which solves this. So in the complex challenges we're addressing and dealing with, how do we talk about change? This is a diagram of the mapping, piece of mapping, causal loop mapping, done across the decline of fish stock in an American town. The local authority is somewhere up to the top to the right. And what you start to realize is there's many, many actors involved in complex challenges. Even what is relatively simple, all the way from fertilizers being used to gang violence eroding trust. All of this started to make me think, well, maybe some of the indoctrination that we'd been receiving of there being a simple problem and a simple solution was actually part of the problem. This idea that change could happen because of actually one little magic app or technology. What is the new type of behavior that we need? And if you look at it, Many of the smart cities' agendas, many of these big city, civic agendas have largely struggled in many parts of the Western world because actually we have multiple actors involved in the reality of our worlds. There is no single actor which has autocratic power. Yet our organizational mindset, so if I went to a local authority and said, hey, you've got to improve education, they'd say, yeah, I've got a strategy for that. But if you map the people involved in educational attainment, there would be a hundred different influences. Prenatal nutrition, postnatal nutrition, actually um, breakfast clubs, education clubs, afterwards, I can list hundreds of different influences which drive educational attainment. Yet, actually, we write strategies as corporates. Decline of fish stock is usually typically taught talking about the regulation of actually fishing, not gang violence affecting social capital. How do we write strategy? How do we do change in a complex world? And this, result, this reflects itself everywhere. Whether it's actually any of the big issues, we know all these issues are interrelated. There is no simple solution. There's no simple one idea. And when we start to think we can deal with it with one idea, how do we start to do change? And we know the scales of this problem at a personal level, at an interpersonal level, and then at a complex systems level, institutional level. And increasingly, one of the things we've started to realize is that actually the city is a natural natural center point of this story, a coalition, a space for coalition. And maybe our theory of change has to be different. Not a better world, market fixing, term sheets, startup funding, business plan, product innovation, 
founder, the classic linear line, maybe it has to be different. Maybe we have to talk about a better city, changing the system, different type of contracting, financing systems for change, not products. System innovation, collaborative entrepreneurship. What does that look like? What happens if you have 20 different organizations working together to shift an outcome and you are financing 20 different organizations? How would you organize? What would an accelerator look like when you were working from that lens? And this is some of the things we've been trying out in this journey to get here. So this is not a simple eureka moment. Over the last 10 years, we tried out investing in social enterprises per se, and we found they struggled. You know, when Hub Islington was built in 2004, 2004 or 5 by Jonathan Katie and Mark Anetti, actually it was all about actually organizations making good. When we built actually Impact Hub Westminster, it was all about actually how we talked about startups for social change. And we realized at the end of it, it wasn't going to do it. When we built Impact Hub Birmingham, we actually changed the frame. Firstly, we started to talk about less about Impact Hub Birmingham, more about an epic Birmingham. How do we make the city an amazing place? We focus on the city as our core issue, not the hub. We ended up crowdfunding it. Emmy Core can tell you more about it. 65,000 pounds raised from citizens from within the city. Why? Not because of the money. Crowdfunded money, as many of you will know, is very expensive money. You did it because of the legitimacy, because of the new model of accountability it gives you. You become accountable to those citizens around those issues. But this isn't just built like that. It's built on a series of events that happened, building the social capital to grow to that point. So when we often talk about co-working spaces or social co-working spaces, you often see the glitzy picture like this. Nice. <laughs> Lovely. Let's flick. But that's the real story. A TEDx of 100 people, a TEDx of 400 people, and TEDx this year of 750 people turning up. Coffees, Kickstarters, it's the social organization of these institutions. If you start to map the journey, the journey of a building is not the plan, it's a social organization. And the problem is, all our mapping technologies are still focused on the plan. We don't know how to communicate this stuff properly. So in this new model of the hub, what we're often talking about is these things. Movements for change. How do you, if you want to improve radical childcare in, in Birmingham, which is what, one of the things we're focused on, we're talking about building a movement around childcare, which involves parents, not just the local authority. How do you get a thousand people involved in the issue? You know what the politics is like, right? Unless you can package the politics, you can't drive the change. Yes, there's a role for startups in driving that innovation, but how do we start to do that? But that's not enough. What does legitimacy look like in this sort of model? Whose legitimacy? I'm not voted, voted in. How do we build accountability in this conversation? And then how do we finance this? All our financial models are based on financing discrete things, products. Single startup, single issue. There's this dirty word called, word called derivatives. Some of you will know it. It's basically a contract of contracts. So where you fund a series of, you invest in a series of things which diversify your portfolio and it sits on top of that portfolio to give you a guaranteed return. Imagine if you are funding 20 different things for virtuous outcomes. What would that look like? How would you organize change in that way? And these are some of the things we're starting to explore. But it also changes, I mean, there's lots more detail. I, slides will be shareable, so you don't worry about that. 
but also it changes the model of an accelerator, right? Typical accelerators are focused on the product. We focus on the open inquiry. How do you build the politics of that infrastructure? How do you build the conversation? How do you grow the movement? How do you do this openly? But these aren't things that we all know. I'm not here to say this is the model, guys. What I can tell you is a bunch of really interesting questions coming up. How do you contract movements? I don't know. But I do know something like smart contracting is going to be very important in actually financing a thousand person organization in a different way. What does legitimacy look like? I don't yet know. What does governance really look like when you're operating through a system? Actually, I think it's going to be much more around behavior and openness in a really different way. The other thing I realized was you don't worry about the outcome. What you worry about is growing the group intelligence. That's your real long-term metric. You're not worried about actually the single godlike view of the perspective of the whole system. What you worry about actually is every actor becoming smart collaboratively. And that talks about building a different type of environment. That's the sort of picture you should be looking for in co-working spaces. So in this future where we move from the I to the we, here's some of the stuff what we're learning. Startups to systems. Systems, not objects. This is a piece of design we did on, on a school where we took a school and dismantled it. Too often you'll get the designers designing different layers of this. We designed this to be a distributed school into a local town using existing resource. What we focused on was actually the kind of connected tissues, not the objects. This is a piece of work looking at actually how you build a health, uh, sort of public health uh, uh, innovation environment. People wanted us to do a mastermind. We said, no, actually there's about 20 different actors involved in driving this change. And these go all the way from open making all the way through to the hospital. How do you organize that stuff? How do you do that stuff? We also learned this public-private conversation is also archaic. It's an illusion. There is no such thing as a private company, effectively. And more and more, you see, it's like to see the data proving it, which is most private companies are dependent on common goods. And the state itself is not the preserver of public goods. It's an actor, one of many. So once you start to take a systems worldview, you start to take a different view of what is public and private, which might be an industrial idea, an industrial notion of this clear idea that something can be private. It can't. Every corporate is massively interdependent on public common goods. And these are archaic notions holding us back in a discourse. How do you start to procure in this future? when you can't predict tomorrow. Maybe you start to procure on outcomes because you don't know what the intervention is. Maybe the best way to drive educational attainment is not to change the school. It's to actually get a librarian who loves teaching how kids to read. We know that has massive effects. Three to four year old reading ages are massively affected by librarians and the passion of a librarian. Great piece of research by Harvard. Which school has given their money away to the local library? So how do we start to shift our narrative? What does leadership look like in this conversation? Well, it's definitely not corporate leadership. It's not management of a corporation. It's management of the mission. Leadership of the mission. Leadership of a group of people involved in delivering your outcome. You know the mission document that you all have in your memorandum articles, we aim to do this? That thing that isn't out there publicly and you're not holding yourself accountable to every day? That's what you're leading. You're not leading your group of people. I often sit in front of local authority leaders who turn around and say, you know, I've spoken to our organization, but it's like, 
dude, your organization is not, the, not who you're leading. You're leading 1.4 million people. That's who you're accountable to. That's who you're reporting to. That's who you're inviting to change and be part of your process of change. And it's also about collaborative change, right? To do this, you have to invest in building shared language. This is why this stuff takes time. And what we're also seeing is a shift in language, a shift in taxonomy, shift in how we describe things. And we have to be really precise. This is why I often sit there and say, people say, well, that's a private organization. It's like, dude, what do you mean? You talk about shareholder wealth? Well, maybe. But there's a whole bunch of under, other interdependencies. I think McKinsey have now come up and said pretty much 30% of the balance sheet of a corporate is actually fully dependent on public goods. At least 30, and I think it's way more than that. So how do you start to build the shared language? How do you start to sense together? Remember, you don't have corporate power here. You don't have authority here. How do you build shared intelligence? Shared decision making. Actionability. And this is not about having a godlike consultant sitting there telling you all the plan. This is about how we as a movement become smarter about the things that we do. And wisdom. And how do you build the politics of change? It's, it's a dirty word. You know, often I talk about it, it's the politics of change. Well, we don't do politics. But guys, if you're even moving your, if you're rearranging your kitchen in your office, you talk to the right people. That's called politics. You're buying different biscuits, you'll talk to four people to make sure you don't piss anyone off. <laughs> it's called politics. You do politics. You just don't think about it. But, and when you're writing your strategies, you don't talk about it. You give some bland business plan, I'll talk to the four stakeholders in the right sequence. How do we talk about the politics of change? Because it's fundamental, especially when you don't have organizational power. And we know, and this is where it gets serious, we are in Western, Western societies are not autocratic systems. We don't have centralized power. So unless we build a way of organizing movements, we do not have a means to drive the change necessary anymore. We do not have the means to drive the change necessary anymore. This is not a choice. It's pretty much the only architecture of change that we have left. And this requires different models of leadership, different models of organizing, different models of legitimacy, and different models of financing. I'm going to skip a little, but not too much. It also means a different idea of design, right? Different idea of strategy. And you're seeing it passively. Design is no longer about designing the thing. You design the conditions for the thing to emerge, the conversation. I go back to this. It means that we're structuring different conversations. So if we want to talk about the power to create society, we have to talk about different means of organizing and a different means of having that conversation. And it isn't about this. This is a fallacy. And in a way, what we're all designing is architecture of large conversations. Large conversations of a scale and order necessary. And that is the real UX challenge, every challenge you can talk about. And we're all structuring these in different ways. I don't think any of us have succeeded yet. I think in terms of democratized cities, we also have an obligation to actually demonstrate the change that's possible. And I think this is where it's not enough to theorize this stuff. You've got to practice it. And you learn in the act of doing. You learn through hundreds of mistakes. And you, that requires a different type of behavior and leadership as well. But 
I'm pretty much on time, so I can, I can say this. For me, the reason why I'm here and what I'm really fascinated by is unless we actually find a means of change to deal with the complexity that we're in, I think we're stuck. We're stuck between the hard choice of centralist populist ideas or actually really investing in democratizing the capacity for people to change society. We're stuck in this choice. And this is not a UK problem, right? We all know this. UK just manifested the Brexit in a very particular way. This is an issue in every Western civilization pretty much right now. So if we want to drive change, we're going to have to build a new organizational model. And that requires us to build an architecture of large conversations. And with that, I say thank you. Let's stay for a Q&A. I don't know if I can talk. <laughs> I'm a little bit shaken. I don't know what you guys saw there, but I saw hope. <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I'm a little bit surprised at my own reaction. I have some questions, and then I'll let you ask questions. And there is no reason to react this strongly to this, except a lot of my buttons were just pushed just now. Um, I wonder in the first, thank you, this was fantastic. Uh, have you guys? come across in your projects a lot of resistance from entrenched power structures? Um, strangely, strangely, no. Um, I know it sounds really weird. I don't think the problem, I, intuitively, everyone gets this. I've spoken to CEOs of large corporations all the way through local authorities. The problem is not intuitive. Intuitively, everyone gets this. The problem is, we have institutional design which doesn't get this. So our audit mechanisms don't get this. Our contracting structures don't get this. The way we write, uh, the way we build brands doesn't get this. Marketing doesn't get this. Our traditional idea of asset and ownership doesn't get this. So when you look at it in, in a structural sense, the problem is not. Intuitionally, I've seen very, pretty much most CEOs get this. The real issue is we haven't built the contracting infrastructure, we haven't built the kind of HR mechanisms, we haven't built the institutional infrastructure. And that to me is our real challenge, is how do we start to build the institutional infrastructure? We don't even know how to communicate and draw it. What does strategy look like in a movement? Maybe you're not focusing on the thing, you're focusing on the mission and the intelligence capacity. So your means and behaviors all change. And that's stuff that we, we just haven't built the groundwork. And I think that's the real challenge. The challenge is not that leaders don't get this. I'm pretty much, I've seen every typology of leader get it. And actually, this connects back to what we were hearing yesterday. Maybe one way of thinking about strategy in these contexts is moving through those boxes, because yeah. that is, translates, I think, directly to what you were saying. Yeah. It's about growing the knowledge uh, in the collective. Yeah. Um, and this connects to my other question, which is how do you make systems legible to people of different backgrounds? Because we're not all used to thinking in systems, and, and now you say everybody should collaborate. How do we, how do so, we even? Yeah, so this is, um, I'm going to just flick through something, because I think it's just, it's a really interesting, um, this one. This diagram, right? That systems diagram. Yeah. That diagram was produced over two years with citizens on post-it notes by fishermen, by farmers, students. It wasn't a McKinsey's consultancy overlay on the world. It wasn't about a consultant saying, I understand the world. It was about every actor becoming conscious of their interdependency. And that was the first leverage point of change, is actually actors starting to say, this 
oh, I realize what my impact is, and vice versa. That capacity is the real fundamental. I don't, look, I mean, here's the fundamental question, right? Every one of us here is a 13.8 billion evolutionary machine. 13.8 billion years of evolution have got you here. You are phenomenal. You are phenomenal beyond imagination. You're better than any AI ever has seen, and every worker that you've seen is better than every AI you've ever seen. And the reason why that's important, and it is really important, is that we think of each other as somehow sort of inferior and not able to get this. It's not true. Remember, every human being you come across, and I mean every human being, is a phenomenally powerful intelligence capability engine. Phenomenally. Yet we all treat them like bad robots. <laughs> now they're just not going to follow the command till I tell them. So I don't think this is a capability problem at all. I think it's a respect problem. Yeah. And it's a problem that we abstract knowledge out to consultants and other actors rather than facilitating knowledge to be at the center of everyone's lives and facilitating their agency, not the consultant's agency or people like me. I was going to open the room for questions now, but I feel that that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> in fact, let's, even though we are these immense machines, in, 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 immensely impressive machines, we can also absolutely ask trivial and simple questions. <laughs> Don't worry. Does anyone have one on their mind right now? Harold. Here, right here. Yes. Indy, thank you. Uh, hugely inspirational, as always. Um, I do have a question. Uh, you mentioned that we don't live in autocratic systems uh, in the West in certain places uh, to some degree. Um, but at the same time, uh, we live at a time when wealth inequality is probably at its greatest, yeah. uh, where we have certain actors, maybe a handful, who have billions and billions and a huge amount of power and a huge yeah. amount of influence. Um, you said that everyone instinctively gets it, which I completely believe. But do they get that part of fixing this problem is letting go of the privilege that they have? And is that, how does that factor into this? Because can what we want to build in terms of democratizing the system coexist with certain people having hundreds of billions and other people, you know, uh, not? Yeah. Um, and are they, even though they get it, do they, are they willing to give up the privilege? I, I think it's a spot-on question. I, I can be both hopeful and uh, pessimistic on this one. On the hopeful side, what I find amazing is who's, who here has uh, been part of the universal basic income debates, watched it online, yeah. So UBI is really interesting because what I found fascinating is you've got venture capitalists talking about it, you've got bureaucrats talking about it, and you've got humanitarians talking about it. And it's a kind of unholy alliance um, of everyone thinking, well, this could be a solution. And so on one hand, I think there is probably new universal goods like UBI that could shift this game. And I think, in my view, I think we're one crisis away from a decent, from a UBI. Uh, and I would say it's one crisis away. That's literally how far we are now. Yeah, it's going to be a terrible crisis. Though. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, um, but so I think you. So on the other hand, I think you're right. There is huge autocratic power. We don't even. I mean, like, so most platforms that you see. Um, so any platform economy is largely a monopoly economy, right? So every platform is a monopoly. Yet we regulate them like free free market corporates. Facebook isn't. There is no option on Facebook. There's no competitor, yet we see it, and they often talk about it. It's kind of legitimately talked about as network effects, how do we drive network effects, which is basically how do we create monopolistic structural control on a situation. Mm. So even our language and descriptor of these things is outdated, and we don't know how to engage these things. We're misclassifying these corporates. So I think there's some taxonomy, conversations, language, comprehension. We're starting to see Uber and regulation conversations now coming to the table. So I think we, all these things are emerging. We're starting to see catch up on this stuff. Now, whether we do it in time, who knows? Um, but I think any sustained structures of wealth very soon figure out, actually, 
that wealth becomes very vulnerable very quickly unless you take all of society with you. So mm -hmm. I, I do think fundamentally that, that will override. Whether we're part of that generation, who knows? Yes. Yeah, in time, it's a worrying, yes. I mean, given the, 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 can you press the microphone down here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, go right so, ahead. Yeah. So my question is really, um, as you said, I mean, creating change is very seldomly a silver bullet. It's, uh, I think we all know that it, behind the scenes there is a diagram like this, hmm. but it's very hard to communicate to people to take the first step. If you would present, like if you go to the politicians or go to anybody and say, so we did this over two years, there were 100 people in post-its, I think you're going to get, or well, my feeling is that it's, there's going to be paralysis. It just feels like, oh, I just wanted to have a silver bullet. I wanted to get a McKinsey consultant. <laughs> my question is, yeah. when you communicate to people, how do you help people to take well, so, the first step? So the thing is, the first step is intuitive. So when people start to see the farmers here, in this example, when farmers start to see their fertilizer was impacting fishing stock, they changed their own behavior. Yeah, yeah. That's my, my, so my, my, you, you get the first reaction is auto. Yeah, but it's, how do you get people to even start the process of gathering in a room and talking about this and mapping well, it out? Well, what's interesting is you grow it from the issue outside. So, so on the fish stock for, for conversation, you, uh, and so radical childcare, which is what we're doing right now, actually you talk about the parents who are directly affected by the issue. And then you talk about actually the employers who are indirectly affected by the issue. And, and you invite, invite them. And exactly. Invite them. And so it's an organic process of evolving the system. And actually it's all about building com uh, consciousness and empathy of those actors and their interdependency to each other. So it's never about actually the, the solution, but in the process of evolving and iterating. And also these things aren't mapping, not just problem mapping. You're also actually inviting people to prototype constantly into that problem. And that's where it becomes really interesting. So it's never this problem-solution discourse. We've mapped all the problems, now let's talk about solutions. It's this iterative. And that's where I think collective agency and intelligence is more important than actually the mapping of it. And which is, I often worry about, like system science, like does beautiful maps like this and try to make, you, make themselves look smart. But actually it's not about their smartness I'm interested in. It's all these actors' smartness I'm interested in. Because that's where power comes from. I have a follow-up question on mm. this, because it would seem that, at, especially at the early stages of a process like this, any process like this, there is, there are some, there's a period that is quite sensitive to, yeah. to individual burnout. Like, there are some individuals who are going to carry a lot through their passion. Yeah. And also because, as you were speaking about the funding, if you do um, lateral things, uh, people will be funded from different directions, and you will be very sensitive to some completely sort of almost unrelated organizations, yeah. management changes, or somebody losing their job, something like this. How do you build a resilient organization in the early stages? So I think, so a lot of this stuff is sh shifting away from a resilient organization to a movement. Mm. So if you talk about, say, radical childcare as a hashtag, not a brand. What you're then talking about is people's contribution and accountability to that effect. So actually what you try to drive is peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-public accountability uh, around that mission. And that's what drives the kind of internal process. So you end up taking what are intrinsic missions and making them extrinsic, and you build the shared accountability through that. And that's where you start to see some of the effects. And we're learning this live. The burnout issue is dead real. Uh, because actually the reality is it requires a lot of personal investment to get to the point where it hits critical mass. Yeah. And that's where one of the big things we're talking about is how do we finance systems change in a kind of complex way. Because everyone talks about systems change from a leadership sense, but nobody talks about financing it. And when they do talk about financing, it's largely grant capital. You know, I got a grant funder because he likes me, trusts me. Mm -hmm. But actually, how do we build meaningful change? If we want to shift trillions of dollars, it's not going to happen through grant capital. So we have to find real means of financing this stuff. Spot on. Dear friends, Indy Joha. Thank you. I can take the clicker, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.